Welcome back to the GTN show. Now answer me this, does anyone out there really struggle in the cold? Yeah, I've got to be honest, I try to be tough, but I really do feel it. And it actually turns out that this difference between some of us feeling the cold and others not may actually be down to our genes. So I'm gonna be covering that in today's show as well as one of the most impressive marathons in history and some really cool 3D printed tech for cycling, including a bike that's gonna be made by Adam Hansen himself. Right then, I don't know about you folk out there, but I am an absolute wimp when it comes to cold temperatures. I try my best to put on a brave face, but I've got to be honest, I really struggle. Now I've swum in water temperatures well below 10 degrees Celsius on countless occasions, but I absolutely hate it. But on the flip side of that, there are some people out there that just do not seem to be phased by it at all. It just really doesn't affect them. Annoyingly so, in fact. Well, I may have an answer to this because new research actually suggests that some people may be lacking a skeletal muscle gene called alpha actinin 3 or ACTN3, which actually helps them to become or be more resilient to cold temperatures. Which I gotta be honest, does make me feel a little bit better when you think of the likes of Lewis Pugh doing these crazily cold swims through the Antarctica. Obviously, I'm not discrediting by any means the achievements and accomplishments of someone like Lewis Pugh and other folk out there because they have clearly spent months and years adapting and are training to be able to do this. But this recent study does suggest that if you are alpha actinin 3 deficient, then your body just can maintain a higher core temperature and therefore shiver less when exposed to these cold temperatures. And I probably should add, if someone like Lewis Pugh isn't deficient in this gene, then blimey, they are doing an amazing job. Now anyway, back to the study, they looked at 42 men with a mix of this gene and without. They exposed them to cold water around 14 degrees Celsius for a maximum of 120 minutes or until their core body temperature reached 35.5 degrees Celsius. They broke that exposure up into 20 minute blocks with 10 minutes at room temperature between. Now only 30% of the participants with this gene reached the full 120 minutes in the cold exposure, whilst 69% of those that were deficient in the gene completed that full cold water exposure time. They also actually assessed the amount of shivering during cold exposure, which they actually said those that were without this gene, the alpha actin in three, actually shivered less than those with it. So in short, this study has shown that those without the gene can tolerate cold temperatures better, but more crucially, they're actually able to preserve and maintain energy because they're not shivering as much. They have also stated that future research will need to investigate whether similar results are seen in women. But there we go. So next time I am shivering away in the lake, I'll be quick to tell people that it's probably because I have this ACTN3 gene and they may not. I mean, it's probably gonna be quite embarrassing if I'm the one deficient in it and they've actually got it. But anyway, um, <laughs> that's gonna be my excuse anyway. It's probably a good time actually to tell you something that me and Heather are doing um, whilst we're out cycling because as you would have seen, we've been filming in some pretty rubbish weather here in the UK. And it, whilst it is a very glamorous job, it's been absolutely amazing. When we're filming, we're not always moving that much and we can get quite cold. So we've been really fortunate to be sent some products from Vulcan, which include heated base layers, gilets, heated gloves. So we're gonna be keeping warm on shoots from here on and next winter and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, do go check them out. And it's honestly something I probably could have done with years ago, in fact. Right then, on with the try news, and I've got to start by talking about this phenomenal marathon over the weekend that likely wasn't on any of your or many of your radars. Now, it was the Lake B1 Marathon that was not only one of the most competitive real life marathons that we've had for a very long time, but also insanely fast. Now, it was won by Kengo Suzuki. He took the tape in a new Japanese record time of 2.04.56 and set a huge PB of over five and a half minutes. However, imagine this, running a 2.09.54 and placing 42nd. Yeah, that's right, 42 athletes all ran under two hours and 10 minutes for the marathon. And what also makes this incredibly amazing, there's pretty much all of those athletes were Japanese, which just shows the huge depth and talent that they have in Japan. And 
pretty much, well, none of them are on the Olympic team, which is just mind-blowing. Well, on to another very impressive performance, and Bill Munger was a racing car driver, or is a racing car driver, that lost both of his legs in a crash. Well, he has just finished a triathlon covering 140 miles in just four days, all in aid of comic relief. Now, in April 2017, Billy was pulled from the wreckage of his F4 racing car at Donington Park here in the UK after slamming into another car at 120 miles an hour. So at the age of 17, he was placed into an induced coma. And when he awoke, he was sadly told by surgeons that he'd had to amputate his legs below the right knee and above the left knee. But he astonished everyone because 11 months later, he was back in the car and racing in the British F3 Championship races at Alton Park in Cheshire. And now, he has just gone on to complete a triathlon. Now, he started this incredible challenge last Monday when he did an 18-mile walk in Gateshead. He had then planned to kayak in the Lake District on the Tuesday. That had to be delayed to the Wednesday due to bad weather, in which he completed six and a half miles across Oldswater. On Thursday, he then completed a 65-mile bike ride from Birmingham to Blenheim Palace and then on fri Friday he finally finished a challenge with 18 laps of Brands Hatch which is again a motor racing circuit here in the UK on a bike and then three laps on foot crossing the finish line at gone 8 p.m. on that Friday so wow I mean incredible achievement incredible story there so serious hats off to you Billy. And to round out the news this week we've got a couple of fun techie bits here now firstly 3D printed cycling shoes, custom made from scans of cyclists' feet. Now these are a creation of Olympian and longtime bike fitter Colby Pierce, who's actually partnered with a new company called Law, spelled L-O-R-E. Now they will scan your feet and then be able to print a carbon fiber monocoque design. And for any of those skeptics out there, now this company law is actually formed of some pretty well established design and engineering folk from the likes of adidas tesla dps nike and even black diamond so don't just think this is all just talk they actually have some pretty good substance here to potentially make something quite impressive or at least we hope now as they state this isn't just about fit and comfort this is also about efficiency which you i guess you'd expect from a carbon fiber sort of monocoque design and well Unfortunately, I don't really have much to show you just that. They're really keeping us on our toes. But if you'd like to find out more or, or be kept up to date, because they'll hopefully be releasing imagery in around April springtime, head on over to their website, lore.cc, and you can sign up to find out more then. And whilst we're talking about 3D printing, I've got something that I'm pretty sure is going to capture everyone's attention here. Now, Adam Hansen, who, for those that aren't aware, is a retired professional cyclist. He retired in 2020, having had an amazing career as a cyclist, been to countless grand tours, and shifted his focus towards triathlons and Ironman racing for 2021. Obviously, we didn't get to see all that much of him in 2021, but it sounds like he's kept himself busy because he has taken full advantage of not having the UCI rules clamping him down and stopping things that he can and can't do. And he has decided to design and build himself his own bike. Yeah. That's right, and it is pretty radical. Now, this self-designed and self-made frame will measure just 28 millimeters wide, excluding the forks, and feature custom-made wheels and derailers, as well as, wait for it, a floating chain ring that optimizes chain line. Yeah, I, I honestly, I don't know how that's going to work but I'm so intrigued. He says, I'm gonna do everything in house. For me, if I just design it and give it over to another manufacturer to produce, then I would never be able to say I made the bike. I really want to do it all myself and I, I take my hat off to that. I'll 3D print the plugs for the mold and then I'll, take, I'll make the mold from the 3D printed piece. Then from there, I'll make the bike from the molds. I've got all the equipment. Now, in case you're not aware, this certainly isn't Adam's first foray into custom built cycling kit because he's well known for his innovations and meticulous approach to equipment choice. I mean, he's been known for shaving weight off bike to get it down to that 6.8 kilogram UCI limit or even 
very famously known for designing his own custom-made carbon fiber shoes. It, now I've got to say, looking at this bike or the, the mock-up design images, the um, CAD images, it sort of reminds me of that Sipo bike that we saw a few years back, kind of merged with that Diamondback Angian, as well as maybe a bit of that tri-rig Omni bike with that sweeping curve from the, from the stem all the way through back past the seat post. What I've got to say is I really do hope we get to see us and maybe even get to feature it in person here on GTM. Okay, now for the race news, and we had an exciting weekend of racing over in Australia because we not only had the Australian Long Course Championship, but championships but also the Australian Sprint Championships. So let's start with the Long Course Championships which actually took place at the Big Husky Tri Festival and that was won by Simon Hearn. Tim Reed just 30 seconds back in second and then just under 30 seconds back again we had Caleb Noble so very competitive on the men's side. Equally so on the women's side with Ellie Salthouse taking the win there and just under two minutes back Amelia Watkinson and then Annabelle Luxford in third. Then over to the Sprint Championships which actually took place in Devonport, Tasmania. We had Emma Jeffcoat taking the win there, Kellyanne Perkins in second and Jazz Hedgeland in third. On the men's side that was won by Matt Hauser with Jaden Schofield in second and Luke Schofield in third. But back to our ever familiar Z Pro Tri Racing, virtual racing on Zwift. Now this is series three but we're into week four of this series. Now as we have done for the previous weeks we start with this individual time trial and that was won by Lucy Charles Barkley on the women's side with Emma Pallant as she's now called Emma Pallant Brown in second and Amelia Watkinson close behind. We had Matt Hansen winning the TT for the men, just beating Sepp Oden, but a big gap surprisingly over Anthony Costas and the rest of the field where we've actually seen Anthony Costas really dominating on the TT in the past. Onto the run, as I've mentioned previously, the runners just had to fit into or make certain time ranges to get certain set of points. So we had a merit of Kessler actually taking the women's run on, but obviously they just need to be within that target, um, which four of them were. On the men's side, we had a larger group of men, but it was Aaron Roy already tensing his guns and crossing that line in first. So then it really came down to that final race where Lucy Charles Barkley crossed the line in first, and took the most points, meaning she actually took overall point or overall win for week four with Meredith Kessler in second and Emma Pallant-Brown in third. Anthony Costas crossed the line first in this final race, took the overall points and took week four overall points. Sepp Oden in second and Aaron Royal in third. Okay, moving on, and before I take a look through some of your brilliant photos and videos that you guys have been sending in to us, I just wanted to stop for a second and actually take a look back at last week's show in which we addressed and looked at this rather empty message from Ironman CEO Andrew Messick, which they posted out over their various social media platforms. And we discussed that on the show, we asked for your thoughts and to send in any comments. And it was really interesting to hear from you guys. And I actually just wanted to take a moment to read out some of these comments sent in, because I, I genuinely found it very interesting. So Dana Flores said, communication is everything, even more so the refunds, and Iron Man have failed miserably. Iron Man has destroyed our trust and their brand name with this entire issue. It's so sad because they did it to themselves. We all know that Iron Man has been horribly mismanaged for years and it's buried in debt, but that's not our fault, it's theirs. It feels like Iron Man is taking as much of our money as possible before they file for bankruptcy. Um, El Goose, on a a slightly more light-hearted, well, I feel bad saying light-hearted because it really isn't, but it said, sounds a lot like the Fire Festival shenanigans again. Now, if you haven't heard of Fire Festival, give it a Google. I think there's even a documentary out there on it. Interesting stuff. Uh, Blake Roberts said, the lack of communication is poor, but the lack of flexibility and empathy is far worse. Often athletes are given, you have next year's event or one of these three ultimatums. And when I and others emailed asking for a different event in the next six months, there was a complete refusal or willingness to be flexible. They've lost a lot of customers for a long time. Uh, the Triathlon Channel said, Challenge Family have been by far the best in handling cancellations. It's just unfortunate that even though Ironman have been the worst and treat us customers awfully, we will all still go back and events will continue to be sold out, leading to no changes by Ironman, sadly. Which is a very valid and interesting point, but 
I think it, well, I think this communication aspect really was key. We saw that a lot in the comments coming in. So thanks ever so much for sending in your thoughts. But I also asked for your thoughts last week on the pros and how you would feel should there not be a pro field. Now, this past year has obviously been incredibly hard for them. That's you know, not an understatement in the slightest because their main source of income has literally been taken away from them. And had it not been arguably for the PTO, a lot of them would not have survived this past year. And well, I sort of debated what would happen if the pro field just completely disappeared. What would you guys think uh, to that? So a couple of people um, commented, and again, very interesting. Mike Scollin said, pros in races makes for a better spectator event. Also nice to say you've raced against the best, even though they finished four hours ahead of you, which is yeah, really cool. And I've got to say, that's one of the things that I loved when I was racing professionally is that I'd be leaving the hotel at the same time as age groupers and you'll be chatting to each other about the same race that you're about to do. And likewise, at the end, you'd then be reminiscing on parts of the course which you had both experienced together, which I think is absolutely awesome. Um, I really like this one though. Maria Tuka said, no pros. That's like being told there's no Santa. I'm I'm 49 and I want to be like Heather Jackson when I grow up, which in my opinion says it all. That is absolutely brilliant. Well now let's take a look at some of these photos and videos that you guys have been sending in. So first up one from Julian. Uh, this is a very nice photo of his BMC time machine in Oakland, California. He says he's taken around the Golden Gate. He said, beautiful sunset over San Francisco Bay with the Golden Gate, which I can't quite see, but I assume it's there in the distance, which, um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful photo there. Uh, next one from Simon, and he's on his giant tr Trinity in Cairns, um, Australia, doing his first full Ironman race. So yeah, awesome, well done to you there. Um, and then another one from Charles. Um, this is his Avanti TT Chrono, set up in transition area, uh, Breeby Bisbon, Brisbane, a bit of a tongue twister there, it shouldn't be, um, in Queensland, Australia, um, doing a long course sprint triathlon race. So brilliant stuff. Please do keep sending in your photos and videos. And if you still want to comment on last week's um, video or show regarding the message from Ironman, then please again, just drop them in the comment section down below. Okay, finally, we have the caption competition. And last week's photo, was this one from Carla Berry, uh, which is an uh, infamously uh, tough course and a multi-lap swim. So we get some cracking dive photos I like this one. Uh, great captions from you guys. Um, Beckett Barnett playing on the uh, COVID stuff. Um, if, this, if this last year was a dive, it would be this. Uh, Greg Daniel, did I put my timing band on? I hope so. Um, backyard engineering. That moment you realise you forgot to check the depth before diving. Uh, but the winner for this week is Paul Shaw said, racing post lockdown, forgotten how to dive. Yeah, I know it's terrible, but go on, you're the winner, Paul. Get in touch and we'll ping a cap out to you ASAP. But for this week's caption comp photo, it's actually not of the pros. This one is of the age groupers at the 2016. So we're going back some uh, years here to the ITU World Triathlon Grand Final in Cozumel. That same race that won the pro race that Alistair helped Johnny across the line. But anyway, someone else going for the flying finish, diving um, across the finish line. Although it doesn't look like they actually managed to seal that spot and nick that spot off the other person. But anyway, uh, get your captions in the uh, comment section down below. But that is it for the show this week. We do, of course, have plenty coming up on the channel, including a very exciting Norseman Viking chase race that we did on Zwift with Gustav Eden and Christian Blumenfeld, which is worth watching just for the banter between Christian and Gustav. So do stay tuned for that one, as well as an aero helmet versus road helmet video. So if you're debating the difference between the two helmets, then stay tuned for that one. Don't also forget that you can head on over to our GTN shop, grab some of our t-shirts, jumpers, towels, all of our other merch. And yeah, if you enjoyed today's video, please do give it a thumbs up, give it a like. Don't forget to give us a follow over on social media and subscribe just down below. And if you'd like to check out some of our other previous videos, we also have time versus distance for running, which is a common debate in running. And also Dan Lloyd's half marathon training plan with a little bit of an update as well as some advice going forward. So yeah, if you're not already following that plan, do head on over and check that one out.